Good morning. Welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship. Glad to have everybody here this morning. Oh, how's, a, how's everybody doing? The ladies had a good, uh, good get together yesterday, I think, and they, they inspired and, and some other folks went way south for a Mark Gunger thing. So uh, I know Mark was uh, just a, got out of his book. I think uh, I like the one that said, Mark Gunder's book, How Not to, Nine Ways Not to Be an Ass. <laughs> I just love his title. So Mark Gunder, of course, is very, very good on the marital stuff and helping us as Christians to get it simple and to laugh at ourselves too at the same time. All right. As far as I know, we have, other than Wednesday, we got prayer here, but I don't know any other events coming up just yet. So there we go. It's a clear calendar at the moment. I'm sure we'll fill it in with something, probably, uh, probably get another uh, game night or something down the line here. It's always good. Anything else going on that everybody, anybody needs to uh, let people know about? All righty then. Let's pray and dive into God's word. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your truth and to... Join us, Father, as your Holy Spirit just moves on our hearts. Father, I pray that you would just touch us or touch our souls with uh, with what is true. And I pray, Father, that you would give us ears to hear and uh, eyes to see it. And as always, Lord, I pray that your word would stick to our souls. Lord, I pray that today every one of us would leave with one thing that, that we're just chewing on. And it's just... We're meditating on it, thinking about it, and it's just uh, drilling down into our hearts. And so, Father, I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, we have seen where Daniel has been praying and, uh, and mourning, if you will. He was mourning about what was going on. Uh, and uh, we're not exactly sure. Uh, I do have a suggestion that I'll come to here in a little bit, maybe where he was at. But he's praying, and, and, and of course, uh, the Lord, I believe, as we saw in the vision, that the Lord Jesus showed up himself and presented himself and just stunned him, brought him down. We're going to talk about that in a second. You know, and as we see what Daniel then goes through, we're reminded of something. You know, sometimes we think our greatest need is like food or air and stuff like that. And yeah, we need those to survive. But those things that Jesus said doesn't feed our soul. Our greatest need is to be loved, to know that you're loved. That's what everybody craves. That's, you know, we're going to just think about in the conversation a second ago. Everybody is looking for something. Like, uh, our sin usually is based on idolizing something else other than God. And part of the reason we do that is because we do not fully know how much God loves us. We can't really understand it because we, we relate it to something else. And something that is often we relate it to things that do not really fully represent God. But we need to know we're not loved. And a corollary to that, if you will, we need to know that we're understood. That's a lot of times when we communicate with one another. We want to be understood. Some people don't communicate because we don't feel like we will be understood. Or we're communicating in ways that other people don't really don't understand. But we want to be understood. We want to be heard. To be loved and understood is, is significant in our relationship with the Lord. And I, you know, when I think about it, as I was thinking about who we're talking about, I'm going to tell you I have a hard time. I have a hard time. I have a hard time identifying with some of these guys. I, these guys intimidate me. I think of, you know, the people of the Bible, the heroes of the Bible that God says nothing bad about like you know, Joseph, uh, uh, Elijah, and uh, Samuel. These guys, these giants of the Lord. And uh, I, I get intimidated because, Lord, I'm not anything like them. At least they don't feel like it. 
And it's just, it's hard to feel like, well, well, God really loved those guys. That's easy to see. He didn't see why. But would he love me? I'm not like any of them. But even though it's hard to relate to these guys, they're all human. They're human just the same. And every single one of them, just like me, needed a Savior. Even though, and, and this is something to keep in mind, is God can proclaim anybody righteous. He can. And he said, at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he talks about particular people that were righteous. And we're like, well, just a second, did, did, did Jesus have any died yet? How's that work? Well, God said that they were because of what they were doing. Doesn't mean they were saved. God saw them as righteous. They were upright kind of people. And that can be intimidating. Now here today we're going to see where Daniel, Daniel's just as intimidating. He is told by, by the Lord through the speaker that speaks to him that he was greatly loved. Now is this a designation only for Daniel? I don't know. Something for us to chew on. Let's consider that as we dive into God's word. Daniel was one touched by God. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 7 through 9, and we kind of hit this last week, but I want to look at it again. He says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fell, and they, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw this, this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance, my good looks, if you will, were, were, was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. That's where we left off a bit last week. And, it's interesting that in John's vision and in the book of Revelation, it has a parallel to that very, that very thing, and where he too experienced the same thing when he saw Christ. And it says, Revelation 1.17, the very part, first part of it, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. So there it is. This is his response to the majesty, the, the wonder of this person that he saw. And I think about that, you know, it's just like, oh, in our hu humanity, you know, why would we respond this way? Was it just an ingrained fear of God that they had this, you know, would a, would a little kid respond the same way? I don't know. It's something to think about. It's like, why would these guys have this? Of course, these folks were very familiar with the, the pattern and exposure to royalty and authority. So as adults, they would recognize that right away. They would understand authority and understanding that power that would be there. And I think a case in point of why this might be is, uh, I think about present day England, since the, the, we're America, we don't have royalty, but they, they do there. But in present day England, their attitude towards the royalty nowadays is they're just rich celebrities. They have a, 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 an alleged bloodline that goes back it's so many so many years, and uh, but there's just celebrities now that live in really nice houses, that's, and they're gated up and protected, and but that's who they see them as. But I think about you know about uh, 300 years ago or so uh, for the royalties and how, uh, the royals and how they treated them then, completely different. And even then, if you went a couple hundred years beyond that, how they were treated. They treated them as like if you, 300 years ago, if you said, because nowadays we've got the tabloid magazine, so even in England, it's the same, they talk about everything, all the, all the gossip, all the shenanigans, the very, you know, uh, irreverent attitudes towards the royals. But if that was 300 years ago, it would have been huh, to the tower with you, you know, because those would have been insubordinate words. And so they understood there was that difference. If, 
If you said something against the king and the queen that sounded like that, that was bad news. You were going to be in big trouble. And I thought, well, there, that's kind of maybe part of the attitude when these guys, these adult men, are suddenly in the presence of this great authority and they fall down. Part of it is, is you know, we, they, uh, they could just faint dead away. They're, all their blood, like even Daniel said, there, his blood, his, his face, his countenance changed because his blood's just draining out of him. And he's like, boom, <clears throat> and he, down he goes. He's like, ah, this, this is the end of me. And that's very humbling to think about. But at this moment, like all of us, Daniel receives compassion and mercy. It says in Daniel 10.10, 10, it says, And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling upon my hands and knees. What a great picture. We don't know for sure who is touching him, and I won't be dogmatic. I think it's Gabriel at this point, but he's not named. We don't know for sure who it is. But this is like one of those times when we're not sure who it is. So really, when the Bible's unclear about that, the idea is then he's like, you don't care, it doesn't matter who's talking, what you want to pay attention is what's being said. Yeah. That's the idea. So whenever you run into that, it's just like, what's going on? We can go off on rabbit trails and try to figure something out that is unnecessary. It's like something's being said, it's about to be said, and that's the whole idea. And that's where he's at. But now let's come back. I want to circle right back to where he said that he was touched. There's more than just a touch. It's talked about the hand, it's like the same phrase they use for laying on of hands. And more than that, this, this person grabbed him. They, lift, they lifted him up. Pulled him up so he's up on his hands and knees now. And so it's just like pulling him up. And, and that's such a great picture of God. I was looking at one of the other Psalms where it just talked about that the Lord pulled me up from the pit of destruction. See, that's, what, that's what the Lord does. The Lord is a lifter of souls. Think about that. When our soul is getting pounded on and drained and debased, that's the work of the enemy. The enemy is the debaser of our souls. The destroyer of our, of our hearts and minds. Whereas the Lord, is, even when he's given us discipline, it is a discipline meant to heal and to help and to lift. That's, that's, that's what he does. You think about the times that the, the Lord lifted somebody up. you got a couple of uh, instances like Elijah. Remember Elijah? He had a great moment. He was kicking butt. He was telling those guys that he went against the, the prophets of Baal. He had the ultimate barbecue party. Or just like, let's see who, you know, the great American, the great Israeli cookout. You know, and it's just like, let's see who can light it up. And it's just like, and of course, God showed up, lit up the, lit up the fire, burned up the sacrifice. But then his enemies, Jezebel, said, ah, I'm going to kill him. And he goes running off. He's like, Ah! He goes running to the hills, and he's hiding in the hills, and he just, he's down. He's out. He's just like, spent. And it says in 1 Kings 19.5, and he, that would be Elijah, lay down and slept under a broom tree. He was just exhausted. Behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Just, that's the way the Lord is. Like, get on up. Get up. It's okay. Comforting him. Similarly, John, we just mentioned just a second ago, his experience when he saw the risen Savior in this vision. And it went on after he fell down dead as dead at his feet. It says Revelation 1, 17, 18. It says, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. So here it's talking about this is Jesus. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So it's just like, Get up, kid. I have all the authority in the world. I'm taking here to take care of you. Get up. And that's what he did. And so that's just the thing. It's just like that God, I want you to realize that God is ever wanting to lift you up. Even when things are, are just 
Go in the crowd. God's there to lift you up. You're like, come on. Come on. You know, they, they say this. It isn't, this isn't the falling down that stops you. It's the not getting back up. Yeah. And that's the thing. God is just ever like, come on, kid. Get back up. Get back up. They even say sometimes you can survive a wound. Some sort of wounds that might kill people. That, but if you get up and keep moving, somehow that helps. And the other famous, the, the skateboarders aren't kidding when they say when you fall down, you look like, ah, oh, crash. They're like, oh, get up. Walk it up. Oh, yeah. I can walk it up. It, it's okay. Oh. And that's what God's doing. Is, get up. Walk it off. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, cause why? Because he has his cover. Because he's the lifter of our souls. But he goes on. And he says this. Because he says that Daniel is one that was greatly loved. Daniel 10, verse 11, and then he said to me, O oh Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. So he starts out this phrase. He couldn't have said, just, he couldn't have said keep getting up, but he said, man, Daniel, man greatly loved. This great idea of being greatly loved is like, he is precious. That's what the idea is. Precious to God. It's also could be God delighted in him. Delighted in him. The Hebrew literally means man <laughs> of preciousness. Man of preciousness. That, again, that's intimidating because it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see why Daniel's precious. I don't always feel that precious, but I can see why Daniel's feeling precious. It would be God would say, You're precious. Delights in him. But see, one of the things we need to understand, and I'm still gaining understanding on this, is in the Bible, especially us as Christians, we have two things going on in our identity of who we are. Two things. One is positional, the other is relational. Many folks have asked, like in 1 John 1 9, it says that if anybody confesses his sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our, our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A lot of people say, well, there it is. Why do, they, why do we then have to reconfess? Well, because what the whole idea is is that we have a positional righteousness. In other words, the moment we have received the free gift of eternal life that's in Christ Jesus, we're like, I am a sinner. I need salvation. I need to know Jesus. I need to have that, that gift that he has. I need to have this, this innocence that he is offering, this, this not guilty plea that he has given us. I need that. I want it, and I believe you, Jesus, that you did it. And the moment that we get that, then we now receive something. We receive a new position. We are now in a new position in God's thing. Because before, our position was outside of God. Then he, like, picks us up. He says, now you're inside. You're in the kingdom. Before you're out, now you're in. And that's our positional position thing that we need to understand. We're positionally righteous. Positionally justified. Positionally innocent. But then, as we live our lives, we discover there's also relational things that are going on. This is where, when the Bible talks about where we can grieve the Spirit. And we sense that we fail God. And we sense that we need to like appropriate this forgiveness again. In a sense, we're not getting new positional stuff because we're already in. What we're now we're dealing is with our relational. We're dealing like our relationship with the Father. Because that can get muddied up, right? That can get, you know, we go around this world. Uh, somebody shared today that they're driving their car and it got all mud on the side and it looked like they were muddy. It's like that's the, what the world does to us. Like we're constantly getting dirt and grit and nastiness. And sometimes we dump right into the pool anyway. It's like, check out the mud bath. Ugh. And then you're like, what am I doing? And it's like, ah, covered with mud. And God's like, okay, you're still my kid. 
you're positionally in me, but we need to clean you up a little. And the blood of Christ is just as sufficient to get us there, it's just sufficient to cleanse us in it while we're there. So that's that relational understanding. So when we see Daniel, who's greatly loved, this is his relational position with God. He, is, he has been relational with God all along. And so he understands that. Now his position, he, again, he needed a savior just like anybody else. And he was waiting, as, as the, the Bible talks about, that the, these saints and all these folks that were there were looking ahead, looking ahead to the Savior that they knew that they needed. But he wasn't there yet. So, again, now we come back to the, that idea for Daniel. He said he was greatly loved. And I don't want to take anything away because Daniel... He was, let's face it, look at it. He was, he was doing all that he needed to do. He was a guy that was hard after God. Just like Joseph. Just like Elijah. These guys, yeah, God loved them for what they were doing. But what about you and I? How does this stand for you and I? It's like, well, I, I don't feel like I'm Elijah. I'm not calling down, the, you know, fireballs from the sky. I'm not seeing grand visions of the future. I'm not... Finding out, administrating whole countries. It's not me. This isn't me. Does God see me? Does God love me? Yes. Because of what Christ did. In Christ, we are loved. There was a couple different places I was looking at this, but the one jumped out. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 through 11. John's little letter talks about this, is that in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. He loved us. And remember that word for love there is, is the agape love. Remember, and for me, I don't say unconditional because it's conditional on him believing him. It's undeserved. It's an undeserved love. That's why grace, we talk about grace as his undeserved favor. Mercy is his undeserved compassion towards us. And this love is an undeserved love. He has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, that the sacrifice, the, the pleasing sacrifice. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And I thought about this one after the fact because this one was there and the, but it, in John chapter 17 Jesus is doing his one of his last prayers before the cross and he said this towards the end and he's talking about you know what he's asking for them he's asking for their life and it says in verse 20 and on he says I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me uh, through their word that they all may be one. It's this unity prayer. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you sent me. This is why we need to love one another. This is verse 22. That the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be even as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Love them even as you have loved me. How much do you think the Father loves the Son? How much does the Father love the Son? That's how much He loves us. That's unfathomable. I can't comprehend it. That's how great 
that love is for us. His delight in us through Christ is that much. Stunning. Stunning to think about it. But more than that, the speaker continues and he says, Daniel chapter 10 verse 11, the next part of 11b if you will, he says, understand the words I speak to you and stand upright for now I've been sent to you. So he gets him, he stands him upright. Gets him up all the way. Not just on his hands and knees, but gets him up all the way. That, this is his love. And it's like, this is more, I was thinking about this, remember we were talking about this in the Jewish culture, when they prayed and worshiped, they would do it standing. Very interesting. But also, in that culture, among all the ruling areas, it was one thing that, remember, because, and this goes to reflection of what I was talking about, well, why they would fall down and bow. Because that's what they were used to doing. Especially Daniel, he, he was in the royal courts. When the king showed up, he knew what he needed to do. Everybody went, boom, down on the ground, bow, because if you didn't, that was a rebellious act. And so everybody went down. But when the king began to speak, you better stand. You're like, well, what does that mean? It meant that you were paying attention. Because if you were still down, you were not paying attention. So the minute the king began to do his, his business, do his orders, they were all required to stand. So now the Lord is lifting him up all the way. The Lord is doing it rather than himself. He's like, I'm getting you up, Daniel, because I want you to pay attention. I want you to hear and understand everything that I'm about to say. <laughs> But I love Daniel and his honesty. It says in the next part of it, it says, And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. It was like, there it is, the honesty. He's not like, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go. It's like, okay, I'm standing, I'm paying attention. Just don't hurt me. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, even he's like missing the idea. He was just told he was greatly loved. But it's still stunning. The whole experience is so stunning. Who wouldn't be scared? I saw a funny cartoon the other day, and it's based off of the, the book of Ezekiel. And if you read through the first couple chapters of Ezekiel, the things that Ezekiel sees is just crazy. Wild things, wild creatures that he sees that are in the spiritual realm. <laughs> and he's like, it's like God, is, of course, even has to tell him not to be afraid. And he's like, and why wouldn't I be afraid? Looking at this craziness, this is like, whoa! Wild and outlandish. So even for Daniel, it's like, yeah, a lot of fear. But his fears were immediately addressed. Daniel 10, 12, he says, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your word. This exchange, again, here he, he starts out just like Jesus did so often. Fear not. Fear not, Daniel. It makes us pause to think. So again, if we see the fear of the Lord, because the Bible says the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The whole idea is that word for fear can have a lot of contextual meanings. But it can mean uh, that you should be you can be afraid, like ah! and dread and, and, and everything and, and phobic almost. It's like that's one meaning, but in the other context, it also means to revere, to be reverent. And so when it talks about the to fear of the Lord at the beginning of knowledge, what it is, it's not talking about quaking fear like that. It's talking about reverential fear. In other words, you're, you understand his position, you understand who he is, and you revere him. You're offering him his due respect. So that's the idea. He's like, so he's telling him, fear not. Fear not, Daniel. Just like Jesus had to say several times, fear not. I, my, one of my favorite ones is when they see him walking across the water, they're like, ah, ghost! And he's like, hey, fear not, guys. It's just me. <laughs> just, just me. So often, you know, just uh, don't do that. 
But he said something in this last verse that we were just talking about that really, again, jumped out at me. Daniel was one who was heard. Daniel 10, 12 again. A little bit down into the verse, he says, For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard and have come because of your word. So he was heard. Why was he heard? Well, it tells us something here about his prayer. It tells us that he set his heart to understand. Set his heart to understand. Daniel was not just merely musing about the Lord. You know, sometimes we can do that. We can be very unfocused when we're thinking about the Lord sometimes. We're just like... Doo, 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 doo. Oh, oh, oh. It wasn't that. It was intense. He was really thinking about everything, thinking about what was going on. He was deeply, the whole idea where it's like his heart was set to understand. It's like he was deeply considering this. He was using his mind and heart. Everything about him was focused on what was going on. And he wanted to understand. That word for understanding it kind of gets at the idea that great consideration. In other words, he was really chewing on it. Always oh, like the, the Hebrew word comes from a cow chewing its cud. In other words, it's like really just gnawing on it. So this was mentally gnawing, intellectually gnawing. He was really thinking about what was going on, what was happening. And again, what was he chewing on exactly? Well, I remember I said I wasn't sure. And I saw a suggestion that really intrigued me. Maybe something for us to consider. Some have suggested that at this time in Daniel's life, remember he's about 84 years old, relatively around this time. Some even suggest he might have been 90, could have been older. He was an old guy. Some have suggested he, at this point in his life, thinking about everything that was going on, was thinking about all of his visions, everything that he had seen. And was just, at this point, maybe for whatever reason, it was bothering him. And so he was just going at it. He was thinking on it, chewing on it. It said he was mourning. It's like a, he understood things were not going to go good. And so uh, this entirety was just there. And uh, something that Daniel really encourages us there is, uh, again, there's no such thing as, oh, I read my Bible once. <laughs> we have friends, we're family. This is, oh, yeah, I read the Bible once. Well, that's nice. This is not a book to ever be read just once. This is a book to be camping on. That's why when us as Christians, we camp on the word of God. We're constantly going back to it because our fleshly minds tend to resist it. We have to go back. We have to constantly be washed by the word. And Daniel, that's where he's at. He's like getting after it. Remember, he, a lot of his prayers, he's been quoting, looking back to God and the things from Leviticus and stuff like that. In other words, he's been chewing on the word of God quite a bit to know what's going on and to think about it, the ramifications thereof. Coming back at it. But Daniel also gives us another key of prayer. It says that you were doing this, setting your mind to understand, but it also said that he was humbling. He humbled himself. That's a key to prayer. Uh, you know, because when we flippantly pray, it's like, oh, Lord, I kind of need this. That's nice. God might hear you. But the whole idea is that Daniel humbled himself. He recognized his deep need. And that's humbling. In other words, Daniel knew it's just like, I am bringing nothing to the table here. This is all you, God. And... When I'm saying that, Lord, I'm saying that in all seriousness, I'm not kidding around. That I don't have nothing here. And as a matter of fact, maybe even Daniel, like I, I, for Daniel, who he was, he was he was a humble dude, and it's just like he probably like I don't even deserve to ask. Remember, humility again is never this false thing. Oh, I'm a worm. I'm the worst, and uh, this and that. That's not humbling. That's that's actually false pride. That's where you're trying to have everybody around you, including God, to stroke you a little bit. Humbling is when you're not even thinking, when you're truly humbled, you're not even thinking about yourself. That's the true humility. But this, this person is speaking, says, Daniel, your words have been heard. What a 
great thing to say. What an encouragement. What a great message to be heard. Does everybody want to hear want to be heard? Some of us are crying out to be heard. To be seen. To be seen. I always love that. I think it was... Um, Oh, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Rahab. I can't remember Abraham's wife, who he sent, or the concubine, he sent out into the desert with her young son. Hagar. Hagar, thank you. <laughs> it's like, when Hagar went out there, and God came to provide for her, and she calls him the God who sees Sees you. A lot of times we're desperate. We're like, God, are you blind? I was like, no, no, I see. He sees. But also the thing is to be understood. You know, oftentimes God understands us. Well, not oftentimes, all the time. God <laughs> understands us way better than we understand ourselves. And that's why we're, when we have our plan. God, here's my three-step plan on how to solve this problem. God's like, that's nice, but you're missing 26 other steps. <laughs> and I'm going to use those. And we're God, well, God, no, God, you can't deviate from my, my plan. This is where you're going. But God understands. He truly understands what we need in our situation. And again, all of this is because it's great to be loved. That's our God. He hears us. He sees us. He understands us. And he loves us. Truly. Truly loves us. Now it's interesting that I say those things. Because in those days, not everybody would be heard. Remember, I shared with you that one of Daniel's contemporaries was the prophet Ezekiel. If you're trying to figure out where Ezekiel is at, if you're in the book of Daniel, go to the, first, the book just before Daniel, and you'll read, see the book of Ezekiel. Another one of those big, long prophecy books that's just like super big. <coughs> it's a, it, it's a, mound, a mountain of prophecy to dive into. But Ezekiel was Daniel's contemporary. But Ezekiel knew Daniel. And it was great that uh, Daniel, or Ezekiel was prophesying to the prophets uh, or to the elders of Jerusalem because they were wanting their city to be saved. Wanted everything to, they wanted everything to stay away. It was, and God like, no, as Daniel said, no, the 70 days, you need 70 years of a rest. And they, they didn't, of course, they didn't want it to be that way. But Ezekiel said this in Ezekiel 14, 14. This is the word of the Lord to him. It says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in that city, in, in Jerusalem, they would deliver their, but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. In other words, he, he saw these guys as the upright guys. It's like, God. Uh, uh, if they were there, I would get them out. Just like, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and his family, the only ones that got out. Like, I'll get those guys out. And Lot and his family weren't even that righteous. They said that if they were righteous, I'd get them out. But then, no, I'm bringing a hammer down on this place. So God didn't listen. God had told, told especially for Jerusalem in this time frame, God had a lot to say. And many, many times with the different prophets, it's like, you're going to want this not to happen. But it's, like, it's got to happen. This pain has got to happen. This discipline has to happen. There's those times you're just like, no, I don't want to go out behind the shit for a spanking. <laughs> but there are times when we really do need a, a, a spanking to get our get get our priorities right, get us thinking correctly. <laughs> and that's where, but for you and I again, God works in these ways. He hears us. Through Christ. Again, it's all through him. That 
That's amazing. That's undeserved. Again, when God hears our prayers, Jesus told us to pray. And to pray in his name. When we say in Jesus' name at the end, that's kind of a tradition kind of thing. But that is a, that's not the magic formula. It's not like, oh, I've capped it off with Jesus' name at the end. The reason I can pray at all, the reason I can, God would hear anything all is because of Jesus' name. Because of what Jesus did. He'll hear me. Because of what Jesus did, I even have an audience. Again, going back to the courts of the king. If you even have an audience, it's because of what Jesus did. That leads us to the last part of this verse, which when I was looking at it, I was like, what is this going on? What? And I realized that the, the translation, the ESV, is like, I'm not agreeing with where they got it what they were doing is because it just doesn't roll off the way we would understand. It says in 1012 verse C, do I that? It says, and I have come because of your words. At first I was like, well, what is he getting at here? I was like, is he, is he doing this because of something he said? Is there like some particular formula here that we're talking about? First that's what I thought. Then I started investigating. I was like, oh, that's just the way they decided to translate it because it could actually be translated differently where it's like, I'm coming because of what you said. It's like, and I'm coming because of what you said and I'm coming to give it an answer. So in other words, he's responding because he has prayed. Not the things that he prayed, but because he prayed. He says, I've come to give you an answer, respond to your words, which is always encouraging that we know that God's going to answer our prayers. As I said last week, he answers three ways. Yes, no, or wait. And that's what he does. He, but, but he will answer. And boy, what an answer it's going to be. That's what's going to be amazing when we proceed forward. Now next week, See, I was thinking we were going to hit it this week, but next week we're going to talk about, you know, this heavenly realm. Because we're given a picture of something that is just fantastic. Of a warfare happening that is just amazing to understand. But before then, we're going to have communion today. <coughs> so, I want to say this. Let's not be intimidated by the super saints. Let's not be intimidated. We, we can learn from them. Even Paul says he was living as a, an example to imitate. They're an example, but they're still just human beings. They needed a savior just like you and I. But they give us a good example of what to do and how to live. You may say, boy, I... I don't live up to that. Well, tell the Lord about that. Say, Lord, I, I'm not like them. Of course, you may hear an answer where he says, well, I know you're not them. Amen. I want you to be you. Be you for me. Of course, you might also answer, it's just like, well, yeah. There's some areas you need to get get straightened up here. Because you're not living as who you, you need to be. See, that's the thing. When you and I are, are in this world, one of the things the enemy, the enemy, the liar, and one of the great things he's lying about is who you who he's he's gonna tell you who you are. And he's not going to tell the truth. He's just going to say, you're an awful sinner. You're not loved. God doesn't hear you. God doesn't understand. God doesn't care. You need to figure this out yourself. You need to go solve this problem by yourself. It's like that song. It's like, be led away by those who have pride. Well, you know the number one person to lead us away? It's us. Oh yeah, the enemy has his part in it. 
That's all the lies. The lies. That's why we. That's why it's amazing to realize how often we have to remind ourselves who we are. It's a joke, if you will. To look in the mirror every morning, it's like, oh, there you are. Remember, even the mirror lies to you. Because the mirror is the reverse image. I love the imagery of the Bible where it says we look in the mirror, but it's all fogged up. We don't even quite see ourselves clearly. And that's the amazing part. Man, I wish I clearly understood who I was in Christ. Clearly. And I will. And you will. When we get to heaven. That's when everything will be clear. What a great and glorious day. So let's prepare for communion. Father, as we prepare to remember what you did, <laughs> that is the word you used. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, you know, you know how forgetful we are. Lord, I pray now that you would help us all to remember, to see it clearly, to know it more fully. Father, I ask this because of the work of your Son. Amen.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's, let's worship him one more time. 